I can't tell you how excited I am, first of all, because this is a, a project in the making for a while. And I've had so many discussions with different folks um, on, on and off this call. And um, I'm uh, just a really quick background on this lecture series. So um, this is a lecture series called Insights, which is uh, focused on um, providing this uh, space for researchers to come and talk about um, their projects that they're doing outside of a clinic at the traditional healthcare setting. So um, mainly it's gonna include a lot of uh, pharmacy-based interventions as well as uh, patients' homes, um, maybe mobile vans or any sort of like interventions that are provided to folks outside. Um, if uh, folks are experiencing homelessness, um, and uh, and really the idea is um, to you know try to create this community um, and space for people who are doing similar types of research, and to try to figure out how we can collaborate um, and help move the research forward. So um, the the topics are going to the presentations will be about thirty minutes in length, and there's going to be ample time for Q and A. So please. Um, make sure you bring your questions and um, the speakers uh, will, you know, try to give a better idea of what's, uh, what are some unanswered questions, what are in the pipeline uh, uh, for this type of research, and then um, also the expertise and the collaborations that, that we can collectively bring to their work. Um, so uh, please um, uh, stay for the Q&A. Um, and I'm just so thrilled uh, that our first speaker is Dr. Natalie Crawford, because Natalie and I have been talking about this for a while, so this is so exciting. Um, Natalie is an associate uh, professor in behavioral, social, and health education sciences um, at Emory University. She's the co-director of the Prevention and Implementation Sciences core for the Center for AIDS Research uh, at Emory. She's trained as a social epidemiologist, um, and also has done uh, training in women's studies and biochemistry. Um, and uh, her research interests are examining the social processes that create and perpetuate racial and ethnic disparities in HIV. So without further ado, I would love to pass uh, the uh, baton over to uh, Dr. Natalie Crawford. I want to thank you for the introduction, but I want to also add uh, another really important point about uh, myself, and that is that I am not trained as a pharmacist, and um, I'm going to be talking to you about pharmacy-based uh, approaches to improving equity in HIV and substance use-related harms, um, but I, um, I see my work is really interdisciplinary that really requires the expertise of pharmacists who are the experts in their field. Um, also, um, uh, the, the um, collaboration between community members who receive critical services, services from pharmacies. Um, and so I, I'm, you know, I'm a social epidemiologist and I, I see myself as being able to bring um, a different uh, lens to this work. And so um, from an interventionist perspective and an epidemiology perspective. And so, uh, but, I, but I do defer to my pharmacist colleagues, such as uh, you, Dr. Saberi, who are really the experts um, in, this, in this work. So without further ado, I just want to give you just a small a, a outline to anchor the work. I'm going to breeze through the background because I know this crowd knows a lot about the epi of HIV um, by race and ethnicity. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, how that relates to sex and substance use risk behaviors and what we know. And then I'm really going to move to um, the role of pharmacies in this work. And I'll start by, you know, giving you a glimpse into how I got into this work, which, which was really through harm reduction. Um, and then I'll bring you to the work that I've currently been doing in HIV prevention, which includes both testing and PrEP. So we all know racial inequities in HIV exist. Um, uh, more than 40% of new infections occur among Black people in the U.S., and Black people are disproportionately affected across every uh, transmission group. So gay and bisexual men, heterosexual women, um, as well as heterosexual men. And we know the numbers have been too small for us to really disentangle this among people who inject drugs. Um, uh, what we've known for a very long time is that sex 
And substance use risk behaviors have not explained these inequities. So racial minority, racially minoritized folks have lower sexual risk behaviors and substance use behaviors. So prevalence of condom use during last sexual intercourse. I generally draw upon older data here just to show the length of time that we've seen these trends um, is that condom use is higher among black women and men compared to other racial groups. Um, injection uh, drug use uh, patterns are lo slightly lower for Black populations, and when Black populations do inject, they are significantly less likely to receptively share syringes, which will put you at a higher uh, increased risk of, um, of HIV. So we see here that Latinos and white populations compared to Black populations are uh, significantly more likely to receptively sh share syringes. Um, so the great part about wh where we are right now in HIV is that there are a number of uh, really positive and successful behavioral and biomedical interventions. Um, our part work is really the but, right, is figuring out how do we get these um, interventions to sustain themselves um, um, over a longer period of time. We know that most of the effects that we've seen on the individual level, particularly for behavioral interventions, tap out after several months. Um, and then uh, another really hard part about what we're doing right now is really trying to figure out how to uh, make sure that these uh, services are equitably distributed. So we, we've seen um, inequity in syringe access, PrEP access, HIV treatment, and as well as hep, hep C treatment for some time now. Um, for PrEP specifically, um, we know that uh, only about 25% of the people who are eligible for PrEP were prescribed PrEP in 2020. I think these numbers have gone up some. From, from what I understand, though, the inequity by race is persistent and increasing. Um, so here we see that only 9% of Black folks who should have gotten PrEP did versus 66% of white folks. And uh, this is... Um, uh, not going to get us to our goal of ending the HIV epidemic. And so um, we are, it's our responsibility to really come up with some innovative strategies to try to reach folks um, to reduce uh, the burden of HIV in these communities. And so all of the work that I've, I've been doing is really thinking about uh, structural models of health and how um, we can shift the entire distribution um, so that um, we can reduce HIV on a on a population level. And so on the left slide, you see that there is a, a population and our, in, our in, interventions normally will target a part of the population at one time um, on the individual level, right? And so there's just that group of people uh, that we are able to to get across our with our app or our um, behavioral modification. And while that is helpful for some small period of time based on what we've seen in the literature, it doesn't shift the entire distribution. And that's what we really want. We wanna shift everyone to more positive outcomes. And so in order to do that, we have to think more broadly on a structural level and we have to either intervene on the availability of services so increasing access, which is a lot of what I see uh, pharmacies as, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, the physical structures, making things uh, more amenable to the populations that are using them. So for an example of this is oral prep moving to injectable prep, something that people don't have to remember to take every day. Um, we can shape structure, social structures or policies. Um, and these might be things that affect um, insurance payments so that everyone has access to it. The other thing that could um, target an entire group to shift the distribution of the population are media or cultural messages, um, something that normalizes these messages and reduces stigma as an example of that. And so what my work is really thinking of is how do we combine these amazing behavioral interventions that we have with the incredible biomedical interventions and uh, make sure the entire population gets them on a structural level. So just to give you a definition of that, these instructional interventions are those that target uh, the economic, social, contextual, policy, or organizational level factors that um, increase or protect against HIV. Yep. How do we... Okay, so... Now um, I'm going to take a shift and and get into why why we're actually here today. And uh, Dr. Saberi definitely gave uh, an anchoring of time, which I'm going to try to adhere to. So, what is the role of pharmacies in this work? Right, we have historically viewed pharmacies as um, a place where we get medication. Right, we think, okay, this is I go to the doctor, the pharmacy is where I go pick up my drug, but 
um, there are there's a growing understanding of um, utilization of pharmacies on the prevention side to prevent a number of diseases um, and and help in the primary prevention. I first really became integrated into this work in pharmacies uh, many, many years ago um, in New York. Uh, New York was one of the first states that passed legislation that allowed pharmacies to uh, furnish um syringes without a prescription through the expanded syringe access program. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide. And so this map just shows, it says a, a pull from CDC. Um, I, I When you can get this map, ebbs and flows, and thankfully I was able to get it, uh, but it, it's out of date. Um, I haven't seen it again. So I hope if there are any CDC colleagues on here, please tell someone to remake this map. Uh, this just shows the states that have, uh, have some legislation where pharmacies can um, provide syringes without a prescription. Uh, but we know that there are a number of studies that um, are, are growing in showing that uh, pharmacies can operate along the HIV prevention and care continuum. So this is a just a table of some of the results um, from a systematic review that I published a couple of years ago. Um, which shows that there are, and and this is this is ballooned actually since then. So I think there are a couple of other folks that have done uh, more recent reviews, specifically around prep. Um, but um, we show that most of what we know about pharmacies' ability to expand HIV um, um, prevention and care is really along the prevention side with HIV testing and syringe services, and uh, um, a lot of that work has um, been really specifically targeted to people who inject drugs. Uh, notably though, there has been less, um, fewer studies that have really targeted the populations that are at the highest risk right now for HIV transmission. That's men who have sex with men, black women, um, trans populations. And so uh, there is a real need for us to understand what are the experiences of those folks when pharmacies are offering these services. So just to take, uh, just to take you through a bit of a timeline of the work that I've been doing in this space. Um, I started uh, many, many years ago, I worked with uh, for the New York Academy of Medicine and uh, NIAM was the group that was responsible for evaluating um, the legislation passed in New York that allowed pharmacies to sell syringes without a prescription uh, through the expanded syringe access program. Um, so one of the, one there were a number of wonderful things that came out of this evaluation. Um, pharmacies were able to do this. Uh, New York State developed a pretty simple um, process for pharmacies uh, being able to do this. Uh, but the downside was that it was not reaching Black and Latino um, people who injected drugs. And so um, as a result, um, uh, there was a big, um, um, in a com community-wide uh, media um, um, intervention that basically sought out to educate community members about HIV, about substance use as a disease. Um, and so they did this in Harlem and used South Bronx as the control community. Um, and what in the pharmacies, what they were able to see was that increased uh, safe syringe use was occurring among people who purchased syringes without uh, a prescription. And that happened by overall by about 100%, but specifically among people, Black people who injected drugs, it increased uh, about 300% from like 5 to 30% or so. Um, as a result of this um, project and discussions with pharmacists, um, this, our, our team began to learn that pharmacists, and this is a theme that I've learned in all of my work with pharmacies, is that pharmacists wanted to do more. They were are very public health minded and community driven. And, uh, and so as a result, we decided to start a pilot test where we rec recruited about 10 pharmacies. And we want we trained the pharmacy staff on how to provide social medical and um, treatment referrals to people who came in to purchase a syringe without a prescription. And this was largely a success. We were able to show in, um, increases in safe syringe use and, and uses uh, use of the referrals provided. Um, and so we still learned that pharmacies wanted to do more. So we decided, well, why don't we test this more rigorously? Um, and so a couple of years later, we decided we started the FarmLink project, which is a large pharmacy uh, randomized intervention of about 88 pharmacies. And the goal was to reduce injection risk among people who injected drugs. Um, this study was informed by a working group of um, 
advisor of, of advisors from healthcare facilities, health departments, and community-based organizations. And the next slide is a little busy, so I just want to walk you through sort of the intervention while I, I tell you the results. So this figure at your top right of your screen essentially shows that there are three groups that are in, in the intervention, right? So there were pharmacies, 88 pharmacies, and they were randomized to one of three groups. The I group, which is the intervention group, the P, which is the primary control, and the S, which is the secondary control. In the intervention group, uh, what we did was we brought them to NIAM on uh, evening, and uh, we gave them dinner, and we trained them about harm reduction principles. We did uh, role play on how to engage with people who came in to purchase a syringe without a prescription. We did a whole host of trainings about what substance use was and um and a number of things. And then after after a pharmacy staff came in for that, we went to the pharmacy um, to reiterate those things and practice in their own environment. And we also talked to them about how to inform their uh, uh, PWID customers, uh, clients about the study and to sign them up for the study. Um, so that is our intervention group. The primary control group, uh, we went to their pharmacies. We, they did not receive this enhanced training. We just went to their pharmacies and taught them how to tell folks about the study. Um, importantly, those of you who develop interventions, you know that, you know, sometimes there's just sort of like a placebo effect and a white coat effect where, you know, they see how we, our views and beliefs about people who inject drugs and we are, uh, we have harm reduction principles. So we knew that they, this group would not be the appropriate comparison between the pharmacy staff. So we recruited a third pharmacy group, which was a secondary control. And these were just pharmacy staff that we called um, along the same intervals, baseline six month and 12 month to ask about their views about supporting uh, programs that sell syringes without a prescription in their pharmacies. And so that is what this figure shows. It shows that at baseline, all of these pharmacies had a pretty high level of support, right? You see that on the uh, Y axis that there's, it's about 65% of pharmacy staff are supportive of this. Um, and notably over time, you see that increase for the intervention group. Not surprisingly, you also see that increase for the primary control group because of their interactions with us, but you see that, see that decline slightly for the secondary control group. So this intervention, despite everything that we were asking those pharmacy staff to do, um, they still were highly supportive, almost uh, just almost at 95% supportive of this program. And so they had really positive experiences with, with um, this program. Uh, for the pharmacy clients who went into the intervention pharmacies compared to those who went into the primary control pharmacies, we saw decreases in receptive syringe sharing because of these harm reduction principles from the pharmacy staff. We saw decreases in perception of pharmacy syringe, um, pur purchasing a, a syringe from a pharmacy as a barrier. We saw increases in the utilization of pharmacies as the primary syringe source and increases in 100% sterile syringe use. So those were all positive. Not surprisingly, we still heard the pharmacies from pharmacy staff that they wanted to do more. And so we thought, well, why don't we test out um, HIV testing in pharmacies? We recruited two pharmacies in Harlem and um, we were able to reach, and we had a really enormous response. Um, we were able to reach individuals at high risk for HIV transmission, racially minoritized folks, um, people who use drugs, people who did not have a recent HIV test, um, and people who lacked regular health care. And this was Harlem. So at that time, there were, were places to get HIV testing. We were able to get 40% HIV testing, but we thought that's still, um, there's still some barriers. There's still something preventing folks from doing this. And so we really wanted to think through how stigma by, might be impacting uh, willingness to take, to um uh, get a HIV test. And so this idea of HIV exceptionalism, we wanted to see whether or not we could intervene on that. And um, as you know, there are some theoretical models around stigma that show that normalization of um, of behaviors or beliefs are is one way to reduce stigma and also increasing access. And so we could increase access in pharmacies and we wanted to try to normalize HIV testing in these pharmacies by packaging HIV with less stigmatized um, diseases. So we packaged it with cholesterol, 
uh, glucose and blood pressure screenings. And then we also did a video where we showed participants um, being offered an HIV test um, within a comprehensive package and, and a, a, the, the participant basically saying, of course, I want to get tested for everything. I want to get screened for everything. Um, that's no different than this. This is all about my, my, my health, my, my full health and not just my sexual health. Right. Um, what we were able to see for, from this study among participants, among clients who went into the video, the pharmacy that offered the video and the pharmacy that offered everything, uh, all of the screenings was that we were able to increase HIV testing by about 60%. And this is specifically among the sample of people who reported high HIV shame and blame. And so we found this really, really promising with thinking through uh, not just how we can offer HIV testing in pharmacies, but how we can um, enhance uptake with certain models of, um, of um, advertisement of these services. So that brings me to some of my more current work um, where we are trying to figure out how to offer PrEP in pharmacy. So between that time, I moved to the Southeast um, and this is home for me. And um, as you all know, uh, the US Southeast is disproportionately affected by HIV. And um, for quite some time, one of the populations that's really the that's been burdened the most by HIV has been Black men who have sex with men. Um, there hasn't been a lot of information about how to expand PrEP in pharmacies in the U.S. Southeast. Um, and so we really wanted to start um, at the very beginning and, a stat and determine whether or not pharmacy staff and men who have sex with men would be supportive of these services in pharmacies in the first place. And so this is, um, we, we, we started with a formative phase where we wanted to determine logistical barriers and facilitators among these two groups. Um, and then we moved to I will, I'll explain the results. So what we learned in this formative phase was that um, both groups, pharmacy staff and men who have sex with men were highly supportive of, uh, farm, of PrEP services being offered um, in pharmacies, uh, but notably and not surprisingly, privacy, I apologize for the background noise. Privacy and confidentiality were uh, the sort of the most important considerations um, for men who have sex with men. And then for the pharmacists, they felt like we really need to be able to train staff on how to do this and didn't feel like they had those resources. We also wanted to compare between the pharmacist and the pharmacy technicians because on, on what their perceptions were of this, because we know when we go into a pharmacy, Oftentimes, the first point of contact that we see are um, the technicians. And so between pharmacists and techs, both of these groups were highly supportive uh, of this happening, um, but both felt like they really needed training. Uh, pharmacists felt like that there was infrastructure, and by this, they felt like, oh, yeah, we have space or we could create space for this. Um, however, pharmacy technicians didn't, and they meant something a little different. What they meant about not having infrastructure was when someone tested positive or, you know, who would they send them to or who would they send folks to to get that linkage of care? And so for pharmacy techs, they really were worried about sort of the wraparound services that were the, that clients were uh, going to receive and, and making sure that they weren't a break in the linkage. Um, but both groups, pharmacists and techs, were willing to in, um, integrate these services into pharmacies and, um, and perform the required functions. So the next thing that we did based on the data that we collected in the formative phase was uh, develop a um, actual formal finalize our, our what we thought our actual intervention would look like. Um, and so we used all that data and then we we had a, a big a nice advisory team and we worked through all of that and then 2020 happened. And everybody knows what happened during 2020. Um, and so we got a little derailed because obviously our pharmacies were working on skeleton staffs and it was just a hard time because of everything that was happening. And so we decided we would um, do a couple of things in the meantime. So the first thing that we did 
was we wanted to, we we call this our, our TPP or transitional pilot phase. We essentially wanted to determine, decide, to figure out, excuse me, if we were able to implement the intervention in the pharmacy, uh, who would we get? Who would come in? A lot of the feedback that um, I got when we were initially um, seeking funding for this idea was that how do we know that people at risk for HIV are going to come to a pharmacy? And I thought, well, <laughs> why would they not go to a pharmacy? But we wanted to be able to quantify, well, how many people at risk will we actually see? So we basically recruited two pharmacies and we trained them on like a very watered down protocol, which was basically just putting this flyer that you see on your screen into the prescription packages um, of their clients and also putting up a, a poster that looked like this as well and in, uh, in their pharmacy. So this flyer and poster had a QR code right here in this orange box that folks could just use their phone and it would direct them directly to a screener survey and then to a longer social behavioral survey. So what we saw during this period of these just two pharmacies were that in passive um, recruitment over just a two-month period that about 460 folks were screened um, and of those, about 81 would have been eligible for PrEP based on their sex or drug um, use risk reports. And so we thought, wow, that's quite a bit of people just in this passive data collection. Uh, what we were surprised to see, though, is that a large proportion of those folks were people who were, would have been eligible for PrEP because of injection drug use. Uh, we thought that this would mostly be because of sexual risk behaviors, but we were really surprised at how many folks um, came in were, were, would have been eligible based on injection. But positively, there were really high, poor, high reports of comfort receiving services, specifically HIV testing in pharmacies. And so that was very promising. The second thing we did during the pandemic was a secondary analysis of the American Men's Internet Survey. Where, where we were um, fortunate to have all put some questions in about uh, willingness to screen for PrEP in a pharmacy. Uh, we uh, limited this analysis to um, the sample of black men who have sex with men. Um, among the sample, there was very high willingness, about 77% of folks reported willingness to screen for PrEP in a pharmacy. Uh, notably, there were not differences in those who were willing by age, employment status, health insurance, um, or sexual risk behavior. So recency of, um, uh, excuse me, recent number of uh, male sexual partners, whether or not they engage, engage in condomless sex or not. Um, there were some differences where folks with a high school diploma were slightly less likely willing um, than those who had less than a high school diploma. Um, and then not surprisingly, people who were willing to use just PrEP in general and felt comfortable going to a pharmacy um, were had, had very high um, support. So the third thing that we decided to do was to say, sort of do a test model to uh, understand what the potential reach of, um, of pharmacies could be in the U.S. Southeast if all of the pharmacies in the Southeast were allowed to um, offer PrEP or prescribe for PrEP independently. Um, but we also wanted to um, understand this story within the context of what, what, how much, where are places that people can go currently as it relates to PrEP. So we did this, um, this is a map of the ending the HIV epidemic counties in, um, in Atlanta, in Georgia. But we did this for all the ending the HIV um, epidemic counties across the U.S. Southeast. But I'll tell you now, the story is the same. Um, for Atlanta, most of our epidemic is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, most of our epidemic is towards the Southeast and Southwest of the city. Um, I'm from down here, closer to the Southeast um, indicator. Um, when we look, with, the next thing we wanted to do was overlay prep current prep prescribing locations. As you can see here in the city, city in Atlanta, in the metro area, there are a lot of prep prescribing locations. Um, as you get over here to the north, 
East, there are still quite a few prep prescribing locations, but where the epidemic is really most concentrated here in the Southwest and further Southeast parts of the city, um, we see deserts of availability for prep prescribing locations. So then we really, we wanted to add on, well, what's the reach of potential reach of pharmacies? And here you see that pharmacies are pretty much located everywhere. Each of these blue dots represents three pharmacies. And we had to make it look like this so that we could actually see where there were pharmacies. So um, we we could see, we you can visualize that there's potentially a lot of um, uh, the growth, the, the ability for pharmacies to be able to ex uh, provide PrEP would probably make a huge impact on, um, on access for populations who need it the most. So fast forward to last year, and we were finally able to start our intervention. And so we wanted, we tested a model where it, it included both ph pharmacists, I, that should be say pharmacist and pharmacy technician led. Uh, there's a self HIV testing model in the pharmacy, then followed by a teleprep linkage. Um, and then linkage to prevention or care, depending on what which if a person tests positive or negative. And then we also examine prep uptake. So the preliminary um, results of this, uh, we started off by training our pharmacy staff. Um, and that was acceptable to our pharmacy staff. However, importantly, um, the training requires um, a lot of um, effort to be up, uh, implemented on the pharmacy staff level. So and many of you, especially if you are a pharmacist, know that coming off the pharmacy line is very difficult. So we had to do quite a bit of work to make sure that all of the pharmacy staff received this training and it took quite a bit of time despite us offering CE credits um, and a survey that also had compensation. And so this is an area where we are going to have to really think through and make sure that uh, pharmacy staff can be trained and it is um, once a, it is it is um, accessible to them in a in a format and a, a venue that they can um, uh, they don't have a lot of barriers. Uh, so then when we did the model on the pharmacy staff, side, they found it accessible, but it was very clear that, you know, their engagement with their pharmacy clients about this, uh, about PrEP and HIV prevention services are going to vary based on their client flow um, and what they have going on in the pharmacy. So if they're really busy, they're just trying to move people through and they're more likely to offer the this model to folks when it's just one person or a couple of people in. Uh, the other important point is that this is likely unsustainable if there is not a consistent payment model. So we reimbursed um, and provided compensation incentives um, through the research model, uh, but in a, in a larger model, we would have to really think about how that works. And so we saw our pharmacy staff, they informed about 247 pharmacy clients about the study. Um, and of those, uh, about 64 um, um, actually up said that they were willing to be screened um, for the survey. And of those who screened for the survey, about 71% um, of the 64 were willing to continue on and take the longer social behavioral survey. Um, the social behavioral survey basically told us whether or not a person should receive an HIV test. And so based on that, there were about uh, 46 folks that should have received an HIV test. Um, but this is where we started to see quite a bit of drop off. Um, only about 17% of those were actually willing to receive an HIV test. Um, and continuing down the step ladder, of those uh, who were willing to self-test, and we had no problems with self-testing in the pharmacy, um, most tested HIV negative, those who did not received a referral to treatment. Um, but among those folks who were um, eligible for PrEP, only a couple of them decided, yes, I'm willing, and that the rest of those declined because they felt like they didn't really need PrEP. Their risk perceptions were low, and this is not surprising. This is what we see in medical facilities where the risk perceptions don't match their actual risk. And so this is a problem that we're going to have to think through broadly with onboarding folks onto PrEP, even after we have made sure these services are accept accessible to them. 
So just to close, um, right now we also have a couple of uh, other studies that have started. The first is the PATH study where we are testing the uh, advancing the implementation science of scaling HIV testing and referral in pharmacies in the Southeast. Um, and then uh, another study where we are we're trying to sort of chip away at this, thinking of this as a puzzle. If we are able to get HIV testing um, integrated into pharmacies, it, can we also formalize relationships between pharmacists and HIV clinicians so that uh, there can be a teleprep uh, linkage that is made? And so we're doing some some work around this with um, testing models of um, collaborative practice um, agreements. Um, in, in, in pharmacies in Georgia. So just to close, I want to thank you all for your time. Uh, we think that pharmacies are viable solutions for reducing HIV and substance use, um, particularly for racially minoritized populations. Uh, in order to do this, though, there are some work system factors that need to be considered for sustained implementation. Um, and we really think that uh, future work really needs to, we have a lot of data right now about how pharmacies can do this, but we really need to figure out the implementation science and make sure that this can be implemented broadly. Uh, so I know uh, Patia wanted me to talk a little bit about future steps and needs. And so um, we are hoping in, PAT, in the PATH study to sort of test some of the scalability of these pharmacy-based interventions. And we want to inform policies, but one of the other one of the things that we're sort of currently grappling with in my lab is thinking through that, you know, there are some a lot of contexts where there is legislation to um, it, to it, uh, furnish prep um, through through pharmacy different pharmacy models, and and every state is sort of different in this. But uh, one thing that we don't really understand and and we see it across all of these states the implementation of the policy is different um how it's implemented uh, well whether it's implemented is the first thing right we see that there are some states that have policies that no pharmacies are doing this work in um how it's implemented is a different um uh, has, has a lot of implications, and then um, how it's enforced and sustained. And so one of the areas that we're really looking for collaborations in is uh, the implementation science of policies themselves, right? How do we apply these implementation science frameworks that we understand to the policies and what happens uh, post, um, well, during the legislation development, and process and once uh, legislation is enacted. So thank you. I would love to hear your thoughts and comments, questions. Uh, we have a good amount of time. I think I did, um, I rushed through a little, but hopefully not too much that you weren't able to understand. Amazing. Thank you so much, Natalie. That was fantastic. Um, I particularly love that map with the overlay of the sites to get prep and the pharmacy uh, sites on top of that was like such a clear indication of why we need uh, more of this work in pharmacy. So thank you so much. Prep deserts. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Natalie, maybe before we jump into questions, maybe we, if you could um, give us an idea of, you know, what type of expertise, how, how can we collaborate if there's people on this call that you think may, um, be potential collaborators. What are, what are things that you need within your projects that um, would be good for us to know about? So I need everything, but I'll tell you, I'll be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> so I like, I, I, you know, I love collaborating and um, I know there just isn't enough time. So I'm also so grateful for so many of my colleagues that I see here today that are also in this, in this work with me. Um, I, I just, I, I love that everybody is tackling this from different angles. But, you know, for, for my work and where I really, I, I'm always, I, I really could use someone that's in policy, right? Mm -hmm. Helping understand specifically pharmacy policy. Um, I think there's a lot for us to be learned there. Um, I know the, the other really important part about this that I think is uh, part and parcel with policy is cost effectiveness. I know, uh, shout out to Jacinda Tran. I know she's working on some of this in her work. Um, but the cost effect effectiveness piece is, is really important. I'm trained as a social epidemiologist. Guys, I do not know how to do that. 
at all, right? Like I am collecting the data that I think would be helpful, but I have no idea how you actually do a legitimate, rigorous cost effectiveness model. And, you know, I'm reading and, but it would be great to have like someone on um, our teams that can help us, you know, it can help inform the, the literature and, and not just the literature, because the way we make headway is really, I think, outside of our literature with policy makers, how we can inform folks like this is what it would cost in a pharmacy and this is what it would cost in a healthcare facility. But that's not the only important part is this is what the cost to the person are who is located in southwest Atlanta and has to go 30 miles, right? Like we need to be thinking about cost effectiveness, not just for our systems, but for the people who, those people in Southwest Atlanta have every, disproportionately impacted by every other disease. There's higher poverty there. There is poor infrastructure. There's worse of everything. And so we need to be really thinking about this from a perspective that is prioritizing the populations who are at risk. Um, the other important point that I, 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 I really want someone to do this, um, I, I've seen some analyses that are somewhat close to this, but I really want us to, and, and I know most of the folks here that are in this work, you guys, especially my pharmacists, you guys know you are experts in what you do and you are not trying to replace a clinician right? Like everyone knows clinicians do something different. Um, but I really want us to figure out how do we produce the evidence that shows that pharmacists are reaching people that are not going into tertiary medical centers. Like they're just not going there, right? They feel more comfortable popping into their pharmacy. And we can think of pharmacies as a pass-through, right? Like people, it's a way to introduce people that are historically marginalized from the medical system how can we, and we, we can think of pharmacies as a way to introduce them with pharmacists who are, are kind people, who are like the nice people in the medical system that people like and want to go talk to, right? Like people like their pharmacists. And we all know that, like that's very clear. And so I would really, that's another place that I would really like to work um, and do work with folks. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, so I think we do have some people on this call who may be able to help with some of those things. Um, so Edwin, I see your hand up and you had a question in the chat as well. Take it away. Yeah, so thank you very much, Dr. Crawford. That was, Natalie, that's, that was fantastic. Um, I, it, from an implementation science standpoint, I'm really interested in your observations around the, you know, the pharmacy management buy, buy in. I mean, you, you talked about the, the challenges and the, the demands on training the pharmacists, but, you know, the workflow issues and the reimbursement um, uh, considerations, I think, are probably going to be really big um, influences on, on whether this actually, like, happens and gets implemented and is, is sustained. Um, what were some of your uh, approaches or observations on dealing with pharmacy management? Um, uh, I know it was done in the, in the context of a study, but I'm, you know, still those issues I'm sure arise. You know, what, what, what did you see? What did you, what did you hear? Um, and what needs to be solved? So that's a great question. You know, I know I said, oh, this is going to be hard, but it wasn't hard because they didn't want to do it. So um, I worked directly with the uh, owner of the pharmacist as well as the lead pharmacist. And when I tell you they really cared about this, they they really, really wanted to do it. And so much, so before we even engaged, you know, and, and I talked to them about whether they wanted to participate in the study, they were like, oh, of course we'll do it. Because I mean, we just, we just had an HIV testing screening that we brought some community organizers that had them park in the parking lot. Like they're, they were already doing so, the things that they could do within their infrastructure. Um, they were just busy, right? Like they were, they're not like different than anybody else. And so the the main problem that we found was rem like reminding them, hey, we put this on Canvas so you can access it online whenever you get some free time. 
And we just had to continue to remind them. Like <laughs> we had to like say, oh, you know, one of the things that I ultimately did with the owner was said, you know, when there's a period, could you have like a team meeting that's early in the morning and that that we could dedicate, we'll bring breakfast or we'll bring lunch if there's a period where you can allocate all of the staff who were there at that time to doing the training. And she was like, of course, done. But, you know, we then we got a couple, but then we still had to get the rest. Right. And so it was just sort of a staggering. And that took time. Right. Because in the research uh, setting, we didn't want to start the intervention until we knew that whoever would be in the pharmacy and talking about this, like they, that they could actually uh, see the intervention through. Um, however, importantly, you bring up a very good point. The reimbursement model. Right. There is no reimbursement model. This is not happening in Georgia and in most of the Southeast, even in states in the Southeast where there's some pathway where folks could provide HIV testing or self-testing can happen and counseling can happen, there's no reimbursement. Like, so people are not going to do it. So, um, like, I, that is a, one of our biggest challenges right now is to figure out how we make this something that pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, if it if it includes pharmacy technicians, can be reimbursed for their time. Um, this is why I think the cost effectiveness piece is really critical, which is why I brought that up. We are gathering mm -hmm. data on how long it's taking folks to do the to inform about HIV testing, do the counseling once they're negative or or um, positive, provide the the linkage so that we can begin begin to provide preliminary evidence of that cost effectiveness. But um, I agree. Um, their uh, time and motion data would be great. They, uh, but until we are able to um, create a pathway, I think that is going to be a, a rate limiting barrier for us. Now, I think there are also other important factors that are going to influence implementation beyond reimbursement. But I think, you know, their pharmacies are businesses and we can't expect that, them to integrate any service into their workflow if they are not going to be compensated for their time. Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Um, Robert, I see your hand up. Yeah, good morning and thank you for your great presentation. Um, I was just on another webinar where we were talking about black gay men and their risk perception. And then your presentation ended on that. And I think we as public health of workers need to change are thinking around risk perception. And so figuring out a way to get folks who are at risk to really figure out that they are at risk. And so folks don't think they're at risk and they really are. Mm -hmm. And we as public health folks need to kind of flip that somewhere. And I looked at your presentation in the pharmacies that are, there's so much possibility there because pharmacies are in community and folks live in community. And so mm -hmm. when you were talking about the South and the Southeast and the Southwest, and then you put all of the potential pharmacies there, I was like, there is such a miss there for opportunities to be able to reach people because those pharmacies are actually in community where you could put your hands on people where they mm -hmm. might not be able to come into the inner city and you'd be able to touch them. And those pharmacies have that opportunity to, to do that. So just my observation, I thought your presentation was really good. Um, I did have a question for you because I came on a little late and you were talking about structural interventions. And I think that really is the answer is figuring out what those structural interventions might be that we could reach folks that we might not necessarily reach on an individual level. So I have a lot of, I have a, just a few, not a lot. I'm going to just not give all of what I have to say back there, but I have some stuff to respond with. So I want to go back to the first part um, with the risk perceptions. Importantly, so I think this is this is not just a black man problem. There were black women that were also like, mm, what do I need that for? And the data, well, I know what my data are clearly triaging you to that because you need it. Right. And keep in mind, which I, I, I didn't say this, but this neighborhood where we had the pharmacy um, is the highest HIV baseline neighborhood in our city. It's the most HIV there. And so 
the the just chances because of where you are. I mean, this is what we see with transmission. And so risk perceptions are a big problem for the Black community right now. It's a big problem and we really have to figure out how to tackle it. We are going to recruit another pharmacy and we are going to test um, whether or not a strong pharmacist recommendation added on to this. We did not train the, this pharmacy for that. We trained this as, you know, this is just a part of your routine care. Um, but we are going to test whether or not if, when we train pharmacists to give a strong pharmacist recommendation on top of this, will that influence uptake? Um, I am hopeful that it will push the needle for some folks, but I think this idea that I don't need this, I'm inv invincible or not even I'm invincible, but like what I've been hearing, particularly from black women, I gave a talk at um, our compass initiative last year and there were a lot of black women in the, cr in the crowd and they basically said, well, all we see for prep commercials and prep billboards is black men. So we didn't think it was for us. And these are black women that have zero converted. And so that, so some of that is the messaging, but then beyond that, I think we just still have this idea of people, particularly young people that are like, why do I, why would I need that? You know, they, they just don't understand that. And so we have to, we have to figure out some of our messaging because historically I think we have done a lot of messaging that is centered around uh, men and that's a problem so we got to walk that back and fix that but I think we also need to do some uh, investigation of what is actually how to what is happening with risk perceptions in reality right like how do we get people on that same on the same page there um there was another point that you made and I, I just say that you know behavior change is not easy right I so know. Folks have to hear those messages multiple times before they actually realize that, oh, you are talking about me. So hearing yeah. it on the billboard and then hearing it from their pharmacist and then hearing it from somebody else might be the thing that pushes them over and realizing that, oh, this is me that you're talking about. Yeah, That's I agree. But I do think we also like as a as public health, we need to we've done a poor job and this is some, I know some of this is structured because, you know, funding is in specific risk populations. We've done a poor job though, of like not making sure everyone understands. Like if you haven't sex, this might be, a, you know, you might be at risk for HIV, right? Like this is just, so we, we, we have done a, some of this ourselves. And so I I'm hopeful that we will like, um, will view HIV, we will also as a discipline, as a group, view HIV as not like, is something that could happen to anybody, right? Like we need to also stop sort of adding that stigma to it, right? Because we are inadvertently one, stigmatizing black men and um, and also neglecting parts of the population who would all, would need these critical services. Thank you for your comments. I could, like, you were getting me excited. So I apologize. I also was going to go on a tangent, but we need this to leave. This is that. awesome. Thank <laughs> you. I just want to make sure we have time. Uh, Xavier, I see your hand up. Take it away. Yeah. Hello, Natalie. Thank Hi. you for your wonderful presentation. I just didn't want to let this escape me. Um, I noticed that you did in-home testing, which I think is a, gr a great use in this setting because I, my career got started as an HIV test counselor, and I know I was doing testing when they were phasing out um, anonymous testing, and that was such a huge detriment to, uh, I mean, granted, I, I got the logic, you know, that if you wanted to get funding for your testing, you needed to do name-based testing, and so I was curious, um, how did you guys, how did you end up with, uh, like, sort of self-testing as your, as your testing kit? So we, there were, there are a couple of factors that led to self-testing. Um, Georgia's legislation is, we are Georgia. Okay. Y'all are all lucky in California. We are, we're not as advanced as you guys. And so um, <laughs> I, I'll tell you guys a story because I think I have a little bit of time. Um, many, many years ago, before I even started this study, I sent a question into our board of pharmacy and basically asked if HIV testing, if they thought it was in the scope of practice for practice for pharmacists in our state. And they were basically like, no, <laughs> 
it's terrible that they said that, but the bright side of that was I ended up meeting uh, a collaborator of mine through that meeting who was doing uh, HIV testing in pharmacies at the time. They were t doing a study and they thought I was a whistleblower. Thank God. Like they, they called me, he got, he, somehow he got my cell number. He was upset, but thankfully I was like, no, we're on the same team. And we started, you know, we started collaborating and now he's, he and I work very closely together now. Um, and, and so we're still working on this, but what also came out of the formative data was that pharmacy staff needed something that was low bar, right? Like they have mm -hmm. so many things that they are doing. And so we thought, well, what if self self-testing, would this work in a pharmacy? We knew it would work in medical facilities, CBOs, our, our community org that we work closely with, um, was doing self-testing and they were having no problems with it. And so we thought, well, this will also help advance the science on whether or not this can happen in pharmacies. Um, and thankfully we didn't have any, there were no problems with it. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Um, just wondering who else, uh, if other folks have questions. I see a lot of my pharmacy colleagues. Yeah, Cheng Lin. Hi, um, thanks for the talk. I think I have um, a two part question. First is, um, this is more like a big picture question. So when we talk about pharmacy based services and, you know, all these outcomes, are we talk about community pharmacy? Um, or I'm just wondering if there are any differences between, you know, like community pharmacy versus hospital pharmacy. And the second question is, so I, I think one of the studies you mentioned is to utilize pharmacy uh, to initiate HIV testing. So what's your um, provision or how do you see pharmacy as the point that can linkage people to care once they get tested for you know HIV positive? Because I think that could be a very important issue that we you know put people in care, right? Yep. So yeah, thank you. That's my question. Okay, wait, before you go, can you remind me of the first question again? The question is um, like community pharmacy versus hospital pharmacy. Oh, perfect. Very good question. So um, so all of what, all, we only work with community pharmacies and importantly, these are independently owned pharmacies right now, right? Um, I've done some work with chain pharmacies. It's more red tape. And while we are establishing this evidence, we have we have really worked with, people, with pharmacies that are independently owned. Um, but hospital pharmacies, I think it'd be helpful. However, uh, we expect, <laughs> you know, they're supposed to be opt out testing in hospitals, right? And that's, uh, yeah, that's not happening. And so um, we, but we, so we, we really thought that we are reaching more of the population that's not connected to care by doing, by working with community pharmacies that are really disconnected from hospital settings, systems. Um, so that's, that part of the question. And I was looking for a pen and sorry, I didn't get one. So can you also come off mute? I, I have a very short memory. I I, it's it happened after having kids. Like it's like, it never comes back. I'm so sorry. <laughs> the second part is um, uh, how do you see the rule of pharmacy to people, uh, to put people in care? Um, yes. So I, I think that, so there are a couple of things that need to happen. And this is what we're, we're trying to test with um, the HIV testing integration in pharmacy. So if we are able to, you know, I, I think pharmacies will be able to get people tested. I think the places where this might, this could kind of fail is if pharmacy staff like or don't feel like they know where to send people. But we actually, in most places, have all these resources, right? So for PrEP, we know we have PrEP locator, right? And we could literally just put a pharmacy zip code in and print it out and give it to the pharmacy. You're <laughs> like, here's the places where you send the people that are negative. We also know where most community organizations are, uh, community-based organizations um, that where people could get um, follow free follow-up care. But I think there's going to be a little bit more work that has to be done on the treatment side. So what we plan to do in the Southeast is sort of develop a directory for, for pharmacy staff to be able to go and sort of search for what's closest either to them, to their pharmacy or to where the individual lives. Um, that's what we're planning on sort of testing in the PATH study and the CAP-UP study to see what, like, how we can make, facilitate that and make sure that we are also not adding, um, or adding 
creating link uh, breakages in the HIV prevention and care continuum, because like, how sad would that be? You know, like if we're further, if we are like starting to reduce inequities on one part and furthering them on another part. And so we do like, we are keeping an eye on that to my knowledge. And maybe somebody else knows, I don't know that there's already something out there like that. Um, and so I'm kind of looking at the crowd because somebody might want to add in, um, in their own context or more broadly, just maybe I'm not aware of it. Thanks so much, Natalie. Please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Crawford for a fabulous presentation. Um, and in the interest of time, we're gonna have to let you go, but if folks have uh, any other follow-up questions, please uh, uh, either email Natalie directly, or if you don't know her email, email me and I'd be happy to connect you. Yeah.